I'll be presenting to you a dual mode silicon insulator, um, CMOS MEMS based uh, thermal conductivity and infrared absorption gas sensor. Um, first of all, some acknowledgements. Uh, grateful for my supervisors, both Vasant and Florin, and also my research funding organizations uh, and collaborating organizations, which is the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council in the UK, um, Cambridge CMOS sensors, and the Soy Hits project under the European Commission's seventh framework program. Um, I'm also grateful for my uh, two groups at the University of Cambridge. So the outline of this presentation is basically I'll introduce you to uh, the gas sensors uh, in the beginning. I'll take you through the CMOS uh, sensor design. Um, I'll then move on to the 3D FEM modeling physics of the sensor. And at the same time, I'll then follow this by experimental and simulation results, followed by a conclusion session. So generally, I mean, the list of sensors is, is, you know, by all means, this is not limited. There's an endless list, and I'm just showing over here a few, you know, sensor types and the measurements. And you can see, you know, for example, in a chemoresistive sensor, you're looking at electrical resistance change, whereas in an imperimetric one, you're looking at more like, you know, current changes. Uh, optical can include infrared absorption, and thermophysical can include thermal conductivity, which is what we are presenting over here. Generally, you would like your gas sensors to have very high selectivity, very high sensitivity, low power consumption, and nobody wants to change the sensors, you know, every three weeks, so you ideally want a very long life as well. Uh, the problems are, like all pretty much other sensors, the signal drifts with time, uh, temperature sensitivity, and also currently gas sensors, commercialized ones are, you know, pretty much large and bulky ones. So what we propose is to develop them using CMOS technology. And the idea is that because the process is very mature, uh, you can get miniaturization in place, you can get uh, low power consumption, and at the same time, you can get very good reproducibility. The best feature is you can get integration of the processing electronics on the same wafer. So this is just a, a schematic diagram showing your CMOS sensor over here, followed by your drive and processing electronics sitting on the same wafer next to it. So if I now look at the, uh, the gas sensor design, how that's structured. So we start off with a SY wafer. So you have at the bottom over here, you have a uh, silicon substrate, which has then the buried oxide layer on top, followed by the thin silicon layer. And that sandwich forms your SY wafer. Uh, we can uh, use the silicon layer both for uh, uh, as a heat spreading layer, or we can embed a temperature sensor in the form of a diode over there. And we have been doing that, uh, so that performs very well for reading the temperature values. Uh, we can then have the upper metallization layers, and we use tungsten in this case over here to form the resistive heating element, which is then, you know, covered over by a passivation layer at the top. And this is all done at a commercial CMOS foundry. So if I look at the design parameters for this sensor, uh, we have uh, a one micron uh, SY CMOS process. Uh, which is then followed by a single deep reactive ionet step where we uh, etch it from the backside of the wafer to get the membrane. The membrane is roughly five microns thick with the robustness coming from the wafer handle, which is roughly 350 microns thick. Uh, the resistive heater is made from the metallization layers and you have the membrane diameter roughly around about 600 microns with the resistive heater sitting at somewhere around 320 microns. So, to do to design this, it's very important to first do a bit of you know FEM modeling in detail uh, because that really helps. You don't want to go and you know do a silicon spin off and then realize oh something is wrong. And what we do is we use commercial commercial multiphysics software. It's a commercial FEM package. Uh, we do the 3D FEM modeling on the actual size of the chip. Uh, this is a schematic showing the chip in a cross section placed on a TO5 chip package. Uh, there is air in the cavity primarily because of the fact that when we package a chip in-house, uh, air is the atmosphere in which we package it, uh, and then we have the analyte gas on top when we sense it. Uh, we use both jowl heating as well as conjugate heat transfer physics. We couple them together uh, to analyze the steady state response of the sensor, and I'll show you the results in a minute. So what's more, most important in this sort of sensor design is how does the heat transfer effects take place? So, looking at this uh, cross section, we can clearly see that both the silicon substrate and the TO5 package, they act as a big heat sink. They're there to take the heat away. So, laterally looking into the packet, into the membrane, 
we can see that the heat transfer will take place by conduction. Uh, at the same time, one would be tempted to think that, you know, uh, heat transfer in the cavity over here would be by convection. But uh, if we assume that because these uh, walls are straight and they're pretty close to the heater, uh, heat transfer to the walls can be assumed to take place by conduction as well. Uh, also because the heater is sitting at the top, so you would have very little, you know, gravitational effect uh, on the density uh, of the, the volume force. Uh, so then what we can assume is that heat transfer to the side walls is also by conduction. And that really simplifies the numerical complexity of, of the uh, simulation. Heat transfer to the surrounding atmosphere now, that's the complex bit, where of course it will be by convection, but as the heat rises, it heats up, the heat rises up, uh, heat has to find the shortest possible path to dissipate. And the shortest possible path for any heat rising from here is not to the, to the you know, going up, it's actually to the surrounding area outside the membrane. So to simplify the assumption, we can assume, okay, this is, you know, also by conduction. And what this does is that at low temperatures, okay, the radiation is not significant. So everything simplifies. Now, how does this simplification, you know, actually lead to an accurate result compared to the simulation to the experiment uh, is coming up next. So that's the um, chip. It's a one by one millimeter chip. We have two of the sensors on the same chip. That's just a zoomed in version of the same sensor. Uh, we are operating this in both thermal conductivity and infrared absorption modes, but you can also use it in a third mode, which is uh, used as a calorimet calorimetric mode. So you can deposit your catalyst on top and have a reference with the sitting next to it. Uh, that's the uh, simulation, 3D simulation showing the results uh, by using air above and below the membrane only as conduction heat transfer. And you can see the plume, you know, on this side above and below in the cavity area. Uh, we also did natural convection and uh, without any airflow, the plume is pretty much the same. Uh, we also did forced convection to see how does that compare. And in forced convection, you can see the plume is now moving towards the side because the flow is coming from here. Uh, it doesn't affect the cavity area because that's completely sealed off. So when we looked at the simulation results, uh, we found out that uh, the delta T difference between these two was not significant at all, which kind of like reinforced the confidence level that, okay, you know, heat transfer by conduction looks good. We can assume that. But when we looked at the, um, the forced convection side, uh, as the flow increased pretty much beyond 100 centimeter cube per minute, uh, you started getting a huge change in delta T, and we have some flow sensors based on this principle, which we've done work uh, in the past in the group. So, here I show you the results for um, uh, simulation, air in conduction only. Then I have simulated results, air as convection. And I also have the experimental result uh, as well. So you can see that there's hardly any difference between the conduction and the natural convection one across the current versus temperature range all the way up to almost 600 degrees Celsius. Uh, and the experimental is not that far off. So in terms of uh, numerical complexity when we're actually computing it, I pretty much managed to reduce my simulation time from a day and a half to a few hours because now we are only modeling everything by uh, as solid. So there's no fluid uh, over here by conduction only. So how does the thermal conductivity principle work? Well, here you have a curve of uh, on four different gases. So you have 100 ppm hydrogen, 1000 ppm hydrogen, and 10,000 ppm hydrogen in argon. And you then have synthetic air on the other side. So if you look at over here at the bottom curve over here, you start off uh, by pretty much by, uh, so the, the main carrier gases over here is argon. Argon has a lower thermal conductivity compared to air. So it cannot take away the heat away that quickly from the, from the surface of the chip. So as argon comes in, uh, you get the temperature rising. Because the tungsten heater has a positive temperature coefficient of resistance, uh, the heater resistance goes up. As a result, the current through the heater goes down and the power level goes down as well. Now, on the other end, when you turn off the supply and you put air through it, exact opposite happens because air being oxygen and nitrogen mainly has a higher thermal conductivity value. And as a result, it takes away the heat more quickly. Um, you get the fall in the uh, temperature, followed by a fall in the resistance value, followed by an increase in current, and then an increase in power level as well. And we can see that these two curves are for 100 ppm hydrogen. This is 
6,000 ppm and that's 10,000 ppm. So as the hydrogen concentration begins to increase, you get a significant, you know, visual uh, effect coming into play. You can see, you can differentiate uh, the levels over here. So concentration wise, we can measure that. But how does the infrared absorption takes place? So these, this sensor, uh, it emits infrared radiation from 0.8 to roughly 12 microns in that range. So it's a wideband infrared emitter. And what we see over here is that uh, we have three curves over here. So we have air, synthetic air. Uh, we have argon and we have CO2 and they're all dry gases. So they're passed through a desiccant. Uh, on the lower end of the curve, we have air sitting at the top. We have uh, argon sitting at the bottom. And CO2 is basically, uh, no sorry, we have uh, argon sitting in the middle and CO2 is at the bottom because CO2 has a lower thermal conductivity value at lower temperatures. So as the temperature increases, if you look at the 700 degree side roughly, the curves have flipped. Uh, so you have CO2 now sitting between argon and, uh, and air. And why is that? Because our CO2 absorbs infrared radiation at 4.26 roughly a uh, micron wavelength. And what you see is that you get, uh, so here's the crossover point over here, somewhere around here. That's not that visible over here, but in these curves, it's pretty much visible. Uh, we have a curve of delta R, change in resistance with power levels for both argon and CO2 with respect to air. And we can see that although argon is pretty much more or less a, a linear uh, sort of a curve, uh, CO2 increases and then it starts to decrease because the thermal conductivity contribution is now being overtaken by its effect that it's actually absorbing infrared heat. And by absorbing infrared heat, it's acting as if it was a gas which had a higher, you know, uh, thermal conductivity value towards like, for example, uh, 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 hydrogen side, for example. And sure. And it, similarly, on the delta T side, we have the curve where you can see the 10 microwatt uh, uh, power, crossover point. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that I've presented to you uh, both a uh, 3 if you're modeling the experimental results. Uh, I think combining various sensing mechanisms is, is great. Uh, CMOS technology is definitely the future. And uh, this work shows that, you know, uh, CO2 can be detected this way by using infrared absorption and thermal conductivity measurements. And with that, I thank you.